Thank you very much. Our regulation panel today features a topic, regulation, consistent regulation of an innovative, innovative insurance market environment. And I'm very happy to have four people with me, four experts, knowing far more about this than I do. Declan pretty much put a bit uh, too much weight into this, uh, telling me an expert. But I have four of them with me. We have Rory. Rory is uh, the CEO of Aon's risk consulting business. He serves as a member of the board of Aon's Global Center for Innovation and Analytics. And Rory is providing us with the business side of the risk and how risks are looked at. And actually, I've seen some of the things he will say. We're going to be really interested to, uh, to listen to him today. Second person on the panel is Tim Shakespeare. Tim, I think he doesn't like me to say that. Tim has been the mastermind behind the PRIPS regulation, <laughs> USITS with the European Commission. He has led the work of the European Supervisory Authorities on PRIPS, but now he's some, doing something completely different. Now he's the head of the Conduct of Business and Oversight Unit of AOPA, and he's going to provide us with a European supervisory perspective. Next to me, William Gdania. I hope he's fine with me pronouncing his name. William is a long-standing colleague and friend from the Brussels business. William is the head of conduct of business of Insurance Europe. And he has been fighting some tough battles between European insurance markets on regulation over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. 15. Last but not least, you already met and heard Don. Don already provided us with this brilliant insight into in the insurance market from a Canadian perspective. I have to add what, to what Daklin said, that Don runs a, an amazing working group at our Global Federation of Insurance Associations, JAFIA. He's concerning himself and keeping ourselves on, on our toes on disruptive technologies in this end. So I'm very happy to have done with us. Just on a very small personal note, I'm very happy to be here. It's a very special moment for me because it's the first time in over a decade that I'm in this room. The last time I was here as a student. So goosebumps and shiver up with these gentlemen sitting here right now. We're right now getting into the topics, if you allow me to. Tim, I would like to start with you. We heard about all of the ideas of the industry. This inventions, reinventions, products, maybe itself. Deville just described, gave an insight of what you're looking in from a regulatory perspective. So what's your assessment of the situation across the EU in terms of conduct? What are the challenges supervisors face on top of what Deville already exp expressed? And is our regulatory environment fit for the insurance market of the future? Nice question. Um, to take stock, I mean, um, we, we face many challenges. Let's, let's put it sim simply, we face many challenges. Um, I'm, I'm speaking um, in part from a, a um, European perspective. So my day job is, is about convergence, and it's about the, the divergence in supervisory approach and the divergence in the outcomes, let's say, for consumers across Europe. And, and it's quite clear that there is uh, significant divergence, and this is, this is a big challenge for us. So irrespective of, of being ready for the problems of tomorrow, we have a, a, a good job, let's say, in terms of addressing the problems of today. Um, I'm focused in, in my day job again on, on the conduct side, and this is, this is for in the insurance sector, from a supervisory standpoint, quite a new... Um, in some markets, not a new thing, but in some markets, quite a new um, area of focus. Um, and, and so we're in a building phase. We're, we're developing uh, capacities. We're developing practical approaches, ways of, I mean, you heard, you heard just before about um, uh, risk modeling on the conduct side, trying to understand where conduct risk is coming from, trying to identify this better from a, from a practical supervisory standpoint. 
and looking at ways of mitigating risks. And, and, and this is something which we're, we're very much focused on at the moment. Now, to, to kind of highlight where the main challenges are, and I, I'm thinking now and speaking now rather with the, the innovation um, agenda in mind, I, I think for all of us, the, there is a significant challenge when it comes to human resources, having the right people on the supervisory side of the table with the right experience. And I, I think that, that is a really important um, challenge for us all. Um, so there is, there is ultimately a question of having, having, the, having the right resources and, and being able to put those resources in the right place. I, I, in the discussions we're having on the supervisory side, they're very often around how to define things, where the boundaries are, what is insurance, what's not insurance, um, understanding how the legal framework applies, and there's a, a lot of debate which goes on in, in that respect. Um, and in that, I would say, it's really important to build a network. So one of the focuses we have on, on the supervisory side as well is trying to build more of a European network of experience and expertise, which also helps, of course, with the HR challenge I mentioned. I would highlight, I mean, there's many other things I could highlight, but there's one other thing I would highlight at this point, and that is um, that from the supervisory side, looking, looking on, on the conduct agenda, I think we... We really need to do a lot more on understanding products and understanding business models. When we, when we look at disruption and how the value chain is impacted by change, to really understand, you really need to understand the business models. And, and I think that's also part of the, the real HR challenge, is getting the right people around the table to do that. So I see that as a real focus area for the future. Thank you. It's the tough challenge you face, I think, in your day-to-day -day life. William, divergence, convergence, 30 member organizations within Insurance Europe. Different habits, cultures, we heard about the culture from developers well earlier, market structures. What are your concerns? What's your take on innovation, new challenges, and new challengers? Okay, um, thank you very much for that question, Florian. Um, it's actually not one question, but two questions that I see in your question. Um, maybe let me start with, with um, innovation and the way regulation approaches innovation. Within Insurance Europe, we have 35 members, exactly. As you said, a lot of diversity uh, within these 35 markets. But they all have a similar constraint when it comes to the way regulation, especially at European level, because this is where my expertise is, um, is approaching innovation. Um, the starting point for us is that regulation should be conducive to innovation. Um, that means that the regulatory framework at European level also should really allow consumers, but also the industry, the existing insurers, uh, but also the challengers to take advantage, to benefit from all the different opportunities that digitalization, new technologies can uh, bring. Um, the question is, is it the case today? From my experience, when I look at the European regulatory frameworks, clearly I would say no. The regulatory framework today at European level is not digital friendly, it's not innovation friendly. I can give you some examples. Huh? The first one is, sorry Tim, uh, nothing personal, but it's in relation to the PRITS regulation and the insurance distribution directive, two new pieces of regulation. The letter, the IDD, is in place for now three weeks. And both these regulations are imposing that uh, disclosures to consumers should be made on paper as a default requirement. And it's only by derogation, if you meet a number of additional conditions that you as an insurance company or distribution channel can provide this pre-contractual information to consumers through digital means. So how digital friendly is this? The second example is in relation to the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which you don't have yet in Canada. Um, but this GDPR is, is, I think people in, in the room know that. Uh, it's providing for a number of new rights to the benefit of data subjects to consumers, including, for instance, the right to be forgotten. And the question is, how do you reconcile these types of rights with new technologies such as blockchain? Blockchain, uh, one of the added value of this technology is really to um, provide for immutable uh, permanent recording of transaction and data. So how do you reconcile blockchain on the one hand and the right to be forgotten in GDPR? 
Five months of application with GDPR, no one has been able to answer to that question. Not even the European Data Protection Board, which is the EOPA equivalent for uh, data protection. So I think there is now really an urgent need on the side of policymakers to remove these regulatory barriers to innovation and to digitalization. That doesn't mean um, introducing new rules. It means really reviewing the existing rules and making sure that they fit for innovation and digitalization. Now coming to your uh, second question uh, about the challengers. Um, well, many of the new entrants on the insurance markets are not challengers. Um, for me, they're more um, opportunities for uh, investment, for acquisition, for partnership. This is what we heard this morning and this afternoon. Um, and they can really help the insurance industry, existing insurers, to bridge the gap between the physical and the digital world. But you're right. Some of these new entrants are also challengers. Um, they potentially um, will disrupt the insurance market. And there, um, there are a number of concerns from the insurance industry in relation to, to innovation um, and in relation to consumer protection. Um, sorry, in relation to competition and consumer protection. Uh, I think insurers are not afraid of competition as far and as long as it's fair competition. Um, and um, the thing is, um, the question about challengers and existing insurers, the question is about the level playing field. We have today a number of um, supervisory authorities across Europe, but also across the world, which are setting new uh, tools to support innovation. We heard about innovation hubs. We heard about regulatory sandboxes and so on, and, and that's really to be welcome. Uh, supporting innovation is good. But then you need to make sure also that all the different players on the market, existing insurers, existing distribution channels, like the new entrants um, and the challengers have access to these different tools, because you might be surprised. I don't think people in the room will be surprised, but also existing insurers, traditional insurers, innovate. And they need also the support from the supervisory authority uh, to that end. Then my second point is in relation to consumer protection and consumer trust. The fact is that it takes years to build um, consumer trust. Um, and these trusts can really be gone in, in a couple of minutes. And it is very important for us to be able to maintain this uh, consumer trust and an adequate level of consumer protection. And that means in practice that the consumers of, um, of insurance tech startups, for instance, should really benefit from the same rights and the same protection than the consumers of existing insurers. This is the only way from our end to preserve consumer trust and make sure we've got an adequate level of consumer protection. Thank you very much. Um, Don, you already spoke about different new models of ownership, <laughs> different kinds of communication, new technologies coming in. I think Jeremy pretty much picked up everything you said this morning in your speech. Um, adding to William, you asked for a different interpretation of insurance regulation this morning. Which concrete steps do you have in mind? Uh, well, uh, Two, uh, two ways to answer the question, I guess. Uh, the Canadian list, which I won't bore you with here because it's long, <laughs> as the, apparently the list in Europe is long as well. Um, but we're well behind um, our European cousins in, in many, many ways. Uh, I talked this morning about UBI, uh, where it's really in its, uh, in its infancy. Our auto insurance systems across Canada uh, are all broken. They all suffer from old uh, and outdated regulations. Um, the ability for insurers to conduct business online and to communicate with consumers uh, digitally as opposed to um, in writing. Just an example of that, um, our postal system at the moment is on strike in Canada. And um, I don't know if you have registered letters in Europe. I presume there's, there's a, a, a version of that. Um, they still live in Canada, and the only industry that uses registered letters is the insurance industry, because when you want to cancel a policy, you have to send a registered letter. Nobody else uses registered letters, but it's in regulation, and our industry is, is forced to comply. So we have a long list of, of specific changes, and, and working with our uh, Jafia colleagues, uh, developing um, an international list, if you will, uh, as well. At a more macro level, though, and this picks up a little bit on some of what uh, Tim was talking about. 
I do think, um, and again in the Canadian context, but there are, there are other jurisdictions globally where I think there's a need for a, a, a mindset change on behalf of our regulators. That the words regulation and innovation in the same sentence uh, is, does not work, uh, you know, to, to opposite ends. That they are mutually inclusive. Uh, but I do think it's going to take a mindset change on behalf of the regulatory community to begin to see a lot of what you were talking about in terms of the ability for incumbents uh, to, to, uh, to innovate. I mentioned in my remarks this morning that what consumers want is to be protected from risk, but they don't want to be protected from change. They're seeing change all around them in all aspects of their lives, but not so much uh, in, in the area of insurance. And, and, and uh, not to throw more at, at Tim, but it is because of regulatory restrictions largely, largely that, that the industry has not been able to bring uh, those changes. Where I do uh, have a considerable sy sympathy with Tim and his colleagues is in the area of resources. Um, our regulators are focused on the world as it is, or on the world as it was, and they're regulating based on, on the regulatory regime that has been in place up until now. And their plates are full, and we're asking them to take on a whole new world. We're asking them to, to think in an entirely new way, and quite honestly, some of them are simply not capable of making that transition. Um, but re budgets for regulatory uh, authorities in Canada have not grown, not that I'm a proponent of growing our regulatory footprint, but, but I think there's a recognition that, that from a resource requirement, uh, they, they are lacking there. And I, and I think we're ultimately, and consumers by extension are suffering uh, from that lack of, of uh, education and training and additional resources that, uh, that I think need to go that way. Rory. And now we have heard the regulator's perspective, we've heard two industry representatives. You add something very special to this group, I think, looking at it from your background and from what you're doing right now. So if you look at the regulatory landscape right now, looking at the captives, SMEs, new tech-based business models, and maybe very specific or niche risk profiles in our industry and for people who we protect, what are the main demands which are out there right now for regulation? But maybe looking at both sides, so regulation on the regulator side and regulation on the company side. Yeah, and listen, thank you for the opportunity to join this esteemed panel and, and maybe talk a little about, you know, through the lens of, of the insured um, here. And, and I suppose in particular, in this case, you know, looking at, at captives, captive owners, and, 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 and other low-risk low entities. And I think in, in asks, you know, as opposed to demands, um, you know, it's not, not very surprising, I think, you know, the, probably the two that I would call out would be that, you know, much used phrase of, you know, proportionality from a regulatory perspective, um, and also consistency, you know, essentially of approach. Um, and certainly, if, you know, from our perspective, you know, uh, you know in the captive sector in particular, the low-risk sector, you know, solvency too has been, you know, a massive uh, undertaking and, and development and, and, and a very successful one, um, I think. I think on balance, you know, where we are, um, you know, from that perspective, we're, you know, far better off. I think the, you know, that the, the regulatory environment is acknowledged internationally. Um, I think the governance requirements are, you know, in particular from captive ownership perspective, they're in line with, you know, what they would expect. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately from a risk-based model, the ORSA gives us a good platform to develop out a, you know, a framework from a capital and efficiency perspective. Um, so, I, I, you know, I wanted to, so I suppose, put that in, in, in a positive context. I think the, the flip side of it in particular from the captive low-risk entities um, is really the time and the cost in particular associated with operating in that environment. And it has been absolutely, you know, huge. Um, you know, for many entities, you know, if you look at before and after, what we're seeing is, you know, increases of general and admin expenses, you know, anything up to 30, 40 percent, which is material, and I think has fundamentally hit a pause button in the enter, continue, develop perspective for some of those entities. 
And again, you know, if that's if that's required, that's good. I think you know the questions that that we have and the questions that we're being asked to your question is, you know, is is it merited? Is it warranted for the scale? Um, you know, essentially of those entities are, is there a more proportional perspective could be taken in respect of things like you know um, QRTs, or you know the external audit of the the, the solvency two perspective or solvency two um, you know framework. Um, you know, or is it warranted the one size absolutely fits all? And I accept, you know, this isn't a critique, you know, for us in the management business are indeed the, you know, the actuarial side of things or the audit side of things, there's processes to go through, um, you know, and, and there's a cost associated with doing that. The, the question is, is what is the value that we're sort of driving through that process? The second area I suppose I'd call out is that from a, you know, data collation perspective, and again, quantum, um, we're talking, you know, uh, lots and lots of, of data, um, and again, from the insurance perspective, sometimes um, sometimes a challenge. You know, if I look at you know just some examples of you know large you know multinational chemical company dual captive strategy within the European Union, um, collecting you know what we call a highly sophisticated risk management entity, but being challenged with collating asset splits in formats that they've never been used to doing and it creating issues internally, which again, as I call it, has, has hit the pause button in terms of the, the sense of all this. Um, you know, other areas you know, to call out is, again, um, you know, aggregation of information, which in the public domain can be sensitive. Um, yes, you know, we have a waiver process um, you know, which can work through that, but again, it's, you know, it's how cumbersome and how, how lengthy a process is that and you know is it is it practical? So, you know I think again I make those comments sort of in a in a positive context. I think you know it's been a, it's been a positive thing at this point in time, you know a couple of years in, as the profile of the risks which we'll touch on in a while evolves, as the regulatory environment evolves as we've talked about here, is there a um, a context for you know proportionality to evolve from that perspective? And just to touch briefly on the, you know, the consistency element, and these may be related, you know, in terms of certain regulators in different jurisdictions, you know, particularly in Europe, looking to, uh, I suppose it's, it's that thing of different interpretation of the same rules. You know, I have a, have a client who comments again, um, big multinational dual captive strategy across Europe, and the, the phrase that she uses is that the ingredients are the same, but the cake tastes differently in different jurisdictions, okay? Um, again, just to kind of bring that to life a little bit, what are we talking about? Things like, um, you know, the, the head of function requirements in different jurisdictions, in some cases for smaller captive low risk entities, you know, responsible individuals, industry experience, you know, linked to the side of the business. In other zones, what we're seeing is explicit technical, um, you know, skill set and experience being required. Again, in cases we've seen this, you know, hit the pause button in terms of developing that, you know, th that strategy, which I don't think, you know, from a captive ownership perspective, from the industry perspective, is just something for us to, again, look at as it evolves, as we're talking about, you know, here today. Thank you very much. In terms of timing, I would like to ask you to be a bit more cautious for the, so that we can give the room and I'm very grateful for these good insight from the regulatory perspective. Tim, you heard a lot, I think, and you would like to answer to a lot of that. <laughs> but I would phrase it in a question in a kind of different manner because it's technology. It's supposed to make our life simpler. So what's down the road on the regulatory technology side and pretty interesting from your side, I guess, on the supervisory technology side? And how can this solve some of the problems maybe which we just heard? Yeah, I mean, I, I will answer that question. I, I have to quickly react slightly <laughs> on this. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not to... Um, in a way, to agree, uh, I, I think, with some of some of the uh, some of what, what William's saying, for instance, because um, um, we, I mean, in, in IOPA, we have an, an insure tech task force which we we've um, developed with our members, and we're having a, a lot of discussions with the, with our members, so the, the supervisors across Europe, around uh, various strands of work, so uh, innovation hubs, proportionality, licensing. Uh, sandboxes, uh, amongst amongst other um, areas of work, and and I, the, the discussions are the same at the regulatory side. Let's put it that way. And I think in in Europe there is um, there is a sense that we 
we need to try and get this right and we need to do better. And, and so I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a very different world in the on the regulatory side. I, but I think we, we all face some challenges. Now, to, to look at the specific topic of um, reg tech or sub tech or reg and sub tech, <laughs> however we say it, I, mean, I think we see a lot of opportunity there. And I think this can also really help with efficiency um, and really using the data that we have. We ha I think we see with Solvency 2 a whole new world and we're, we, can, we can go much further. Now, this is the early days. There's been some discussions and some work by uh, supervisors globally to try and use technology to mine data better and to understand better what the, what, what the data is, is showing. And I think the results have been mixed so far because of problems with data quality. And so I, I think there's a, you, 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 you have an ambition, but then you need to really have a, the basis for the ambition and the foundations right. So I think there are some real challenges there. Um, it's, a, it's a priority for us in IOPA. This is a priority going, going ahead for the next years, that we, we think there is a, a lot of opportunity here that is a win-win for everyone. Um, so I, 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 it's, it's a... It's a a sign of our kind of future work plan. plan. If, you, if, you, if you look at our work planning in the next years, you will see this, this topic uh, uh, very, very much at, at the center. Um, so in, in the interest of time, I'll say, say no more than that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. After it worked very well in the first round, William, RegTech, does it help solving the problem? Short, <laughs> yes. Um... Maybe not that short. <laughs> 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 um, yes, I think again to, to start with, with the basics, um, but I'll be short, um, complying with regulation is, is extremely complex today. It's time consuming, it's extremely costly. It's not only because of the European regulatory framework, uh, but I guess it's part of the challenge. And I know that many, many insurers, but also distribution channels, are simply um, uh, really struggling in meeting these different requirements. And indeed, I think RegTech can help these different companies um, with compliance. So in reducing the regulatory burden to a certain extent, um, we see RegTech can really help them to, to simplify, to uh, standardize, to automatize the compliance and the reporting processes. Also, very importantly, I think it can help companies um, to uh, put resources on innovation and on trying to enhance consumer um, experiences rather than putting the same resources or equivalent resources, human and financial and technological resources on coping with um, the compliance um, and regulatory burden. Um, this being said, uh, we need to be extremely cautious that RegTech do not become um, barriers uh, for, for the different players, especially for, for small and medium-sized undertakings. I'm thinking about um, a situation where um, meeting the regulatory requirements would simply be impossible without the use of RegTech, or um, situations where uh, regulators or supervisors would make compulsory the use of, uh, of RegTech. Uh, in that case, clearly some, some um, players on the market, and again, probably especially SMEs, would face some very, very serious difficulties because they don't have the financial or the technical means to, um, to develop RegTech solutions or to buy them. Um, so it's very important that RegTech uh, remains a solution, but also that it remains an option, so a voluntary solution. And if at one point one regulator or one supervisor uh, is thinking that it should be compulsory, then I would advise them to uh, provide RegTech solution to all the players on the market free of charge. That could be a good trade-off. That's a very proud position, I'd say. <laughs> Don, Ireland is the middle of the world, we learned this morning. Um, however, it might make sense to look to the west or even to the east. What's going on at the international base, uh, level? What's, what's the disruptive technology and rack tech and sub tech? Yeah. Well, my, much like Kevin, I'm, I'm paid by my members to worry. And, um, <laughs> and, and I worry a lot about this one. Um, and now my, if, my, if any of my staff were here, they'd be worried too because they gave me some suggested answers to some of these questions that we thought we might be asked. And, but I've thought about this over the last 24 hours. 
Um, and this subject gets me more and more worried the more, the more I, I think about it. The complexity of regulation um, is not going away. Since, um, uh, since the financial crisis, the G20 countries have brought in 50,000 regulations and counting uh, relating to the financial crisis. Now, they didn't remove 50,000. They, they brought in an additional 50,000. We were chatting before, it's called MIFD2. That was brought in by the, by, uh, the EU, uh, deals with, uh, with capital markets. This one piece had 30,000 pages, 1.5 million paragraphs uh, for this one regulation, and, and companies need to comply with this. I don't care what kind of IT solutions you bring to bear, there's still the human element here that people still need to understand this uh, and to be able to, to implement however it is, whether it's uh, using IT or, or the old-fashioned way. I think companies are going to need a reg tech strategy as much as they need a digital strategy, but I really think we're, we're in some ways kind of getting the cart before the horse. Um, that the discussion that we're having, the first round of questions around innovation and allowing companies to compete um, and to bring to market the products that customers want and consumers want, um, that I see this having the potential to get us all focused on how we comply and focused on a technology solution to, to, to compliance when, in the end, the business that we're in is delivering products that customers want. Uh, and I think we have to keep our eye on that. And I think we have to keep regulators' eye on the fact that, that the playing field is not level. And I think that's a far more important issue than the, uh, than the right tech issue. Uh, just, just one last thought, too. It will change the game for regulated entities um, when regulators are now in real time having access to data and data sets that they've never had before. I, re I do think that a lot of thought needs to be given to what that paradigm looks like because it's different than the one that we're going to have, that we have today. Thank you very much. Rory, it's the thing I looked forward to so much. We heard about technology innovation, new products, innovative insurance <coughs> solution. What are the risks that Bright New World offers to us today, or adds to our society, cyber, and what's coming down out of the track? What's your assessment of the awareness in and outside of our industry on these issues, and how does it change? Yeah, okay. I mean, I think, you know, as we talk about insure tech, fintech, and, and, and reg tech, you know, that will continue to, to thrive. Um, you know, on, on traditional risks that we that, that we see out there, and we talk about it. I think what's also interesting and really exciting, and from an opportunity perspective, is how do we use that to fast forward and embrace you know manage of the of the emerging risks. Um, and you know, I think from that perspective, you know, what we're seeing a lot from a, a you know as the fourth industrial revolution kicks off and business model change is a big switch into more um, risk associated with that are much less tangible than before for that perspective, right? So, you know, in particular for asset light companies, um, physical damage is much less an issue than is inter interruption or disruption of a, of a, of a revenue stream. Um, and seeking solutions for that is, you know, is really important. So if you take something like intellectual property, you know, the number of patents, you know, applied for and the associated li li or litigation is growing exponentially, you know, by the new time. And, you know, you may say, okay, well, is that just, you know, asset light -like companies? But you'll you'll see here on the sorry, just on the exhibit, this this is a massive change, you know, both from '75, but also, you know, realistically from 2005. 82 um, percent of U.S. exports in 2016 were related to intellectual property. We did a study last year um, alongside the Poneman Institute. You know, which identified that about 59% of tangible assets are insured and 14% of intangible assets are insured. So there that represents a, you know, an opportunity for, for us as an industry. So if I move it and take it a little bit further, this change, this you know, evolving profile, it's not just linked to, to asset light companies or tech companies. You know, we're, we're seeing this everywhere and we run um, a biannual global risk management survey. Um, this is 17, we just launched actually today, the, the 2019 survey tool. Um, and, and there's lots of things you could say about this, but I suppose one thing that I'd draw your attention to for those maybe can't read at the, 
the back of the room is that the color scheme here is, from a green perspective, it's insurable. What we're highlighting is partly insurable in light blue and uninsurable in navy. Um, and more and more when we sit down with chief risk officers and with um, CFOs in particular, this is what the risk registers are beginning to look like. Um, these are the areas that are causing volatility for the business, uh, and these are the areas that we're looking to, to solve for. And underpinning is lots of issues around intangible assets, around you know, talent assets, et cetera. So I think there, um, you know, so there's lots of good say. I see the lights are flashing in front of me here, Florian, but you know, this is, I think, some of the issues that we've got to um, think about you know, a little bit more. Um, and obviously, key to that is understanding those exposures, quantifying them. We don't have the data points that we, that we have on some of the traditional risks. There's the underwriting, and ultimately, there's the regulation of the entities that underwrite. So in many ways, you know, I often think about this as sort of back to the future in terms of you know, coffee shop for, you know, in Lloyd's 400 years ago. We have issues. We have volatility. How do we solve for them? I think the tools that we have, and in particular, the empowerment of the data and analytics that we, we have and we've invested in can help us fast forward through this very, very quickly, but it is changing the, the, the volatility profile, the risk profile of corporates. I think we've heard a lot Sorry of about challenge, that. a lot of opportunity, nice insights. I have two questions of my president on this thing, which we're not able to tackle on. <laughs> I think it's not good for the review. Um, <laughs> However, please feel invited to approach our panelists after. Don said, uh, after the first pint of Guinness, he's completely open to any question. <laughs> <laughs> so please feel free to approach him. I think Tim is sticking around for a bit, not too long, but he'll be there as well. So thank you very much, Tim, Rory, Don, thank William. You. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you.